Freud and uh, the question of his etiology of neurosis. This etiology comes with the reminder that socioeconomic orders play some, if not significant, role in the genesis of uh, so-called mental illnesses. If we take writings like Beyond the Pleasure Principle or Civilization and its discontent, Freud most openly insists that the proliferation of traumatic uh, neurosis is an inevitable collateral damage uh, of capitalism. On one hand, there is the evident, uh, for Freud at least, etiological link between traumatic neurosis and two crucial aspects of capitalism, war and crisis. On the other hand, there is another aspect which concerns, I would argue, the capitalist organization of labor and, as Lacan suggested, the capitalist organization of enjoyment around the insatiable systemic imperative of production, of surplus value, and around, around the superego injunction uh, to enjoy. So this is where Marx's definition, definition of uh, capitalist production as essentially production for the sake of production, so not for the sake of whatever, preservation or augmentation or improvement of, uh, of conditions of, uh, of life and so on uh, uh, comes into play. Seen in this light, traumatized or damaged subjectivity could indeed, indeed be called uh, a social symptom. And of course, it would be wrong uh, to envisage in traumatic neurosis uh, an invention of capitalism. Freud does not draw this conclusion. But its technological and economic development seems to enforce rather than reduce cultural traumatism. So Freud's thesis is there is something traumatic inscribed in, in the constitution of culture. Uh, as such, and capitalism uh, pushes this to, to, to a wholly new uh, level. Uh, now, the question of, of, of work uh, is sort of inscribed in the very foundations of, uh, uh, of psychoanalysis. If you take, for instance, Freud's interpretation of dreams, uh, the longest chapter is dedicated to what he calls Traumarbeit, dream work. Uh, this doesn't bring us to the capitalist worker, but uh, it is something that Lacan picked uh, uh, upon uh, when he kind of uh, went further in, in Freud's direction, recalling that the ultimate point of alienation remains anchored in the abstract and virtually endless character of what Freud describes as unconscious work. Is, for instance, one uh, quote to illustrate this from Lacan. It is true then that work in dreams, among others, gets rid of thinking, calculating, and even judging. It knows what it must do. This is its definition. It presupposes a subject that is the Arbeiter, unquote. So he's evoking here Ernst Jünger's uh, uh, 1932 volume, the, the Worker, but he equally targets what, what he elsewhere calls Quote, the ideal worker, the one Marx made the flower of capitalist economy, unquote. So psychoanalysis comes across a certain problematic uh, expression of uh, abstract labor, an economic category that Lacan explicitly associates with Freud's description of the unconscious work in the interpretation of dreams. Um, one could say that as a structural being, that is, as a personification of an economic abstraction, the worker does not think, judge, or calculate. In other words, abstract labor overlaps with unconscious thought. Uh, and although the ideal worker does not exist, it explains the problematic mode of existence of the proletarian, a laboring body consumed by the economic abstractions and systemic uh, imperatives. Lacan even says uh, occasionally that there is only one social system, namely that each individual is really a proletarian. But he is here clearly redefining the, the notion of the proletarian or of the proletariat. Uh, so the, the proletarian overlaps with the subject of the unconscious, or to be more precise, with the subject of the capitalist unconscious, since uh, Freud and Lacan do not postulate the existence of a transhistoric or transcultural unconscious in contrast to Jung, for instance. Um, and one could say, I guess, that from Lacan's point of view, or at least if we push this uh, uh, view that is indicated in these quotes, 
to, to, the, to the end, Marx's figure of the proletariat and Freud's figure of the neurotic seem to share a common fate insofar that they are compulsively working, both physically and mentally, uh, for an exploitative symbolic system which, ex which consumes their entire existence. And I think this is, this is also something that, that uh, 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 is crucial uh, in both Marx and Freud, if we, if we read them. There is a certain, that there is a certain uh, Ausgabung, as, as, as the German word says, uh, uh, taking place. So consumption in economic sense and uh, exhaustion of existence uh, uh, in, in psychological sense. Um, so according to Marx, the capitalist organization of social labor around production for the sake of production and its imperative of constant increase of value confront the laboring body with a virtually infinite task and with an actually unsettable demand. So the mutual conditioning of both, of production for the sake of production, of abstract labor, one could say labor for the sake of labor, uh, imposes onto the laboring subject a most problematic compulsive action which pushes him or her to the point of exhaustion. And in this, in this process, there is something that Jean-Claude Milner uh, uh, kind of fittingly called the parasitism of the infinite on the finite. Um, and in Freud, a homological problematic is at stake. Um, uh, we can, uh, uh, to make this, uh, uh, this step, this is what <clears throat> the, the problem of enjoyment uh, brings to the point. I would like to read one, uh, one quote uh, from Freud where he's, in my, in my view, making a very formally uh, speaking interesting remark. So this is Freud. Our mental activities pursue either a useful aim or a direct gain in pleasure, lustgewinn, so pleasure profit. In the former case, what we are dealing with are intellectual judgments, preparations for action, or the convey conveyance of information to other people. In the latter case, we describe these activities as play or fantasy. What is useful itself, as is well known, is only a circuitous path to pleasurable satisfaction. Unquote. So he doesn't distinguish them. He basically says that these are these are two aspects of one and the same uh, uh, one of, one and the same uh, process. Uh, so the psychoanalytic aim is not to delimit useful intellectual activities from useless fantasy, but to show the wide-reaching consequences of their inter intertwining or indistinction, the, mo the mobilization of thought that is of mental work and more generally of discourse, of language, of the symbolic order, uh, for producing uh, increase of enjoyment, or what Lacan called surplus enjoyment. This production is imminent to every thought process, or as Lacan eventually put it, thought is enjoyment. Both aspects of thought that Freud mentions in the above quote are as inseparable as, and at the same time as distinct as use value and exchange value of uh, commodities in Marx. So the main critical contribution of psychoanalysis to the critique of uh, capitalism would be, uh, bro uh, could be brought down to the recognition of the link between thought, enjoyment, and labor, underpinned by the recognition of their compulsive character. So the third term that psychoanalysis brings into play, and I think, uh, Hannah, you, you kind of in, went into this direction also in your talk when you were talking, uh, when you were talking about the, the presence of desire or, or the attempt to recognize desire in, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, Marx. Now, I would say that there, there is something, uh, that there is another term in Marx <clears throat> that, is, that resonates well with psychoanalysis and goes precisely in your direction uh, that you were, that you were uh, exploring in, in your talk. And we have to go back to the, to the formula by Marx production for the sake of production, which ultimately describes capitalism as organization of social production around the imperative of uselessness and ultimately as a useless mode of production. Um, and the ultimate expression of this uselessness would be fictitious capital, or what Marx calls fictitious capital and we financial economies. Um, in this context, uh, Marx, 
uh, introduces or uses the notion of the drive, trip, uh, which um, I would say places Marx and Freud in another shared conceptual history, and which is also very closely connected to the problematic of this virtual and exhausting character of, uh, of labor. So at the core of this intellectual history, if we want, stands a consequent depsychologization and denaturalization of the drive, which results from the recognition of the drive's constant character. Freud, uh, you probably all know uh, this or have come across this, uh, calls the drive uh, constante kraft, constant force. Marx saw that the demand of capital, understood as a specific force of the capitalist economic structures and relations, is imminently redoubled on the demand of surplus value and the demand of surplus labor, or ultimately it's one and the same thing, depending on the position from which we are, uh, we are observing it. And this redoubling appears in several crucial pas passages of capital uh, where the economic category of capital is brought down to the drive of self-valorization. Further, the drive comes in the guise of a more common and seemingly transhistoric drive of enrichment which builds uh, so some kind of bridge from the pre-modern miser to the modern capitalist. To give you one crucial uh, quote from, uh, from uh, Marx this time. And uh, yeah, you all know it. Only as a personification of capital is the capi uh, capitalist respectable. As such, he shares with the miser an absolute drive of self-enrichment, Selbstbereicherungstrieb. But what appears in the miser as an individual mania is in the capitalist the effect of a social mechanism in which he is merely a cog, triprat, uh, so basically a component of the drive. Um, Marx is nevertheless aware that the drive undergoes historical metamorphosis instead of being an invariable and transhistoric force which would obtain its full actualization under the capitalist socioeconomic conditions. To, to put it with Freud, there is no drive which would precede its destinies, such as repression, sublimation, self-aggression, uh, etc. No drive nature before drive culture. Only because a drive manifests bodily doesn't mean that it's natural. That's, that's, that's the banal point that, that's behind this. Uh, so at first sight, the miser and the capitalist seem to be motivated by the same drive, the drive of enrichment, which is conditioned by the same immaterial materiality of money, the embodiment of value abstraction. Marx writes uh, also another quote, the hoarding drive is boundless in its nature, massless, measureless, without, without the right measure. Qualitatively or formally considered, money is limitless. That is, it is the universal representative of material wealth because it is directly translatable into any commodity." Unquote. But Marx exposes a fundamental difference in both logics of the drive. So the misers and the capitalists even though they depend on the same monetary abstraction. So here's another famous quote uh, from, from Marx. This absolute drive of enrichment, this passionate chase after value is common to the capitalist and the miser, but while the miser is merely a mad capitalist, the capitalist is a rational miser. The restless multiplication, famerum, has a sexual connotation of value which the miser seeks to attain by saving money from circulation is achieved by the more ac acute capitalist by means of throwing money again and again into circulation, etc. So basically, the point that, 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 that I want to make here is that uh, from the modern capitalist perspective, avarice appears as madness, while in the pre-modern non-capitalist mode of production, it follows a certain economic rationality. In the closed world of the pre-capitalist mode, modes of production, which knows no surplus value, the what Marx calls restless augmentation of value can economically only be achieved by, mean, by means of evacuating money from circulation. In this way, value is purified first and foremost of its embedding in the social link and of its social, uh, deprived of its social character and transformed into an asocial fetish object the miser's treasure. 
in the infinite universe of capitalism, so I'm using here Quare's uh, vocabulary, uh, in contrast, the question is no longer how to liberate money, but how to set free its creative potential. Hence Marx's talk of, of Vermeerung in relation to money. Once transformed into capital, money finally obtains its procreative force, Zeugungskraft, it's another uh, use. So the miser can never become a capitalist and his treasure can never transform into capital no matter how much wealth he accumulates. The drive of enrichment is here internalized, restricted to the body and the mind of the miser and therefore appears as purely psychological uh, force, individual mania as, as uh, 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 Marx writes. The virtual infinity of the drive is restricted by finitude, also in the sense that the miser is driven by a concrete object fixation. Money may be an, an abstraction, but in avarice it still anchors the drive in some kind of empiricism, which motivates the miser to evacuate money and valuable metals from circulation to save them from bad, corrupt exchange. Again, the infinity is finalized, restricted to the miserable figure of uh, miser's existence. The latter may be a hostage of his treasure and subjected to the fanaticism of his drive of enrichment, but one could equally say that the treasure and the drive of enrichment are hostages of the miser's finitude. So there is a double parasitism at work, that of infinity on finitude and of finitude on, on, on infinity. The capitalist, on the other hand, stands entirely on the side of speculation. Value is here finally freed from its empirical anchoring and appears and to become an automatic subject, which can generate more value uh, without the mediation of social labor or other forms of organize, organized exploitation. So the capitalist drive is no longer fixated exclusively on money and other objects of value, but rather takes value, more precisely, the surplus, the mea of value in all its abstraction as the exclusive object of its insatiable demand. So this is all, uh, this is all known stuff. Uh, what I want to kind of pinpoint here with, with this double figure or the jump from the miser and the capitalist is that there is something like a transformation of the drive taking place. So that the drive of enrichment is not the drive of self, self valorization These are two completely distinct, uh, uh, distinct drives. Um, and this is where the famous demand for work that Freud associates with, with the drive, Arbeitsanforderung, uh, enters the picture. Um, in the miser's case, no universal demand for work could ever be articulated. The only person who must labor without interruption for satisfying the drive of enrichment is the miser himself namely labor in the sense that he has to renounce private consumption in order to make the treasure grow. Enjoyment is externalized in the, in the sensuous materiality of treasure. The capitalist drive of self-valorization, in contrast, comes in the guise of universal imperative to renounce enjoyment, as Lacan would put it, or with Marx's phrasing, in the guise of the capitalist tendency, for instance, to extend the length of the working day or work life, motivated by the economic fantasy of total subsumption of life day under work day and life force under labor force. And of course, there are other expressions of this demand, uh, demand for work, not only the economic one. The violence of, uh, 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 of primitive accumulation is uh, some sort of a, yeah, uh, mitläufer, uh, uh, as the German say, so like runs all along uh, this, uh, uh, this history of, uh, uh, of the drive. Uh, I think I've been talking for, for, for a little bit uh, uh, too long, so I would say that this is, uh, this is for me the point, I think, where um, Marx and Freud form, form a certain encounter, because the drive, I mean, the concept of the drive, if you look at them, uh, uh, if you look at both contexts, the critique of political economy and psychoanalysis, in both cases we are dealing with a, with a border that, that kind of is situated uh, in between 
uh, the psychological and the social. So it, it pertains to, no, to, no, uh, to none of these two uh, spheres. Um, and of course, even though there are, there are clear differences uh, uh, like in, in psycho, between psychoanalysis and uh, a project that is so openly socially uh, oriented, like critique of political economy, I think that psychoanalysis should not be broken down to its phenomenology. So of course, transference is important. I'm kind of uh, trying to debate uh, with a question from, from earlier today. And uh, the question uh, at stake in, bring, in attempts to bring uh, together psychoanalysis and critique of political economy for me doesn't consist in a one-on-one -on -one translation uh, between both fields, but to determine just the point where a certain jump from what is apparently private, intimate, internal, particular, my miserable traumatic history uh, that pushed me into, uh, into psycho, uh, to undergo psychoanalysis and so on, uh, nevertheless, nevertheless jumps over into a structural register and addresses or touches upon a structural register that uh, is eminently social and that is eminently outside and basically makes me appear, makes me appear outside uh, uh, or as a actualization of a certain social outside. Um, sorry, it was a bit, uh, a bit too long, uh, I guess, but uh, I would hear, um, stop playing the devil's advocate. <laughs> So first of all, um, uh, thank you, Ben, for uh, this conference and for this uh, invitation to the leftist panel on uh, psychoanalysis and the critique of capitalism. I prepared, uh, I, I read a longer version of uh, Samo's paper. I'm totally impressed by hunting, his hunting down of all that labor in Freud. But when I hear labor, I think from my Theological obsession, I think, about its opposite, and that's grace, and it's a question about <laughs> grace. Yeah? Whether that's not more a crucial point when it's about psychoanalysis and uh, capitalism today. So I have one question for Samu, uh, I think which is a fundamental one, but also an introductory one, because it's meant to open a plenary discussion. And so as uh, Samu brought this up during his uh, splendid, one has to say, presentation. It starts with a brief reflection on avarice. In his uh, sixth uh, seminar, Desire and its Interpretation, 58-59, Lacan quotes several times one sentence from a book entitled Gravity and Grace. There we have it already. Yeah. <laughs> Written by the French politically engaged philosopher and mystic Simone Weil. Not white, but while. I won't go into the details of Lacan's use and explanation of this sentence, but make a few direct comments on the issue. And that issue is, as mentioned before, avarice. And in particular, the often comical figure of the miser about whom Simone, Simone Weil states, and here's the quote, to ascertain exactly what the miser whose treasure was stolen lost Thus, we would learn much. So this intriguing quote raises the following question. What is there to learn from the miser, Lavar, eh, who lost his treasure? Or put even more simply, what does the miser exactly lose when he loses his treasure? Is it something or rather nothing? From one point of view, it's clearly something, for he holds on to it, hides it jealously from others, and it seems to be the one and only thing he cares for. It's definitely something in that respect that it gives his life, using the word central to Simone Weil's reflection, gravity. This gravity, according to Weil, should be opposed to grace. Grace is the capacity to open oneself up to the unexpected, to what one does not have to what exceeds our human and therefore finite attempts at controlling life. 
mystic but you, esoteric but you. Eh? <laughs> so here one would expect while to condemn avarice, for indeed isn't avarice a capital sin? And wouldn't one expect Weil to criticize avarice as a short-sighted, petty clinging to, trans to transient material things, testifying to a gravity which obfuscates the dimension of, divi of divine grace? However, that's surprisingly not the case. Geiz ist gut, as it were, for the miser teaches us something about desire, an important lesson one should not too rapidly dismiss with moralizing content. Although the miser is hooked onto his treasure, onto his strong box filled with gold and money, the main characteristic of avarice consists in not, in not enjoying what he owns. The miser may cherish the, his treasure and may continuously look for ways to increase it, Yet he does not make use of it. On the contrary, he lives a life of abstinence and self-inflicted hardship. In an odd way, the life he lives appears, to a great extent, as the life of someone without any means. The miser, therefore, while argues, can teach us what desire is about. That's an ongoing longing for something without ever actually attaining it. A life of desire, open to a satisfaction that is still yet to come. For while this reflection on the miser is only a step in a longer argument in favor of Christian religion, which, as you know, also deals with a treasure one can only desire for, without actually enjoying it, that's God. So simply put, Christians are misers, with a small yet crucial twist. Orientated on God, they don't need gold or money to desire a satisfaction that belongs to the future. Following this argument to, 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 to uh, its extreme, while even argues that God withdraws himself from humanity in order to allow Christians never to mistake him for a thing that they could actually enjoy. God is no thing, he's nothing, and the less he seems to exist, the better. For this allows Christians to fully and genuinely desire that void named God. Let's now, however, leave aside for a moment Christianity and its mysterious lessons and return to our miser. We started with the question whether the miser, were he to lose his treasure, would actually lose something or rather nothing. To answer this question, one can make use of Wyatt's observation that the miser treats his treasure as if he did not have it for he could easily make use of his financial means, but he doesn't. So in a certain way, our miser would lose nothing if his treasure were to disappear. And his enjoyment of the treasure does not reside in making use of it, but on the contrary, in not making use of it, which limits and transform, transforms any possible enjoyment into what I would call, a little bit in a Kantian way, a reflexive enjoyment. Let me explain this by taking into account other details to the figure of the miser. First of all, the, miser tre the miser's treasure often contains, at least partially, money he cunningly obtained through ruse, theft, or usury, which makes him to a feared but also despised and lonely person. This, however, doesn't, doesn't seem to bother him. On the contrary, precisely the fact that the money can and has been taken away from others, makes it into a desirable object. This helps to get why our miser doesn't spend the money. His enjoyment is supposed enjoyment, that is supposed in the other, the fellow human being. The pain these fellow human beings experience with, when being destitute, as is made clear by their tears, cries and prayers, endows the treasure with value, turns it into a sign of the enjoyment others would experience if only they had access to it. A thesis which is furthermore supported by the odd phenomenon that our miser interprets others' behavior with regard to him as so many signs that they are after his treasure, like the jealous lover for whom everything has become a sign of his partner's infidelity, the miser's relation to the outside world is governed by the profound suspicion that one wants to rob him of his most beloved position. Possession. So it's a very simple, paranoid but simple world. 
Therefore, in a nutshell, when the, when the, what the miser teaches us about desire is that it can produce enjoyment, not by consuming an object, but by considering it as the sign of a potential enjoyment. And money is precisely this object, the object par excellence, that combines on one hand utter uselessness with, on the other hand, promises, fantasies of what one, of what one could do with it, of how one could enjoy it. So it seems that if we were to look for an example of the Lacanian plus jouir, uh, which is a pun, uh, which is a pun on, on plus, uh, plus in the sense of loss, loss of enjoyment, and makes it coincide with more a supposed and expected enjoyment. So the miser's treasure seems to be a good candidate. Yet one aspect seems to be missing, or not to be quite right here. The miser's money, although hidden and not used, has a separate material existence and functions as a fetish, dis disavowing what within the psychonautic field is commonly dis named castration. That's already in a certain way what you suggested. Eh? That the miser is a, is a figure to, be, to whom something must happen, uh, which happened. Eh? And here, Samo already highlighted uh, the emancipatory and liberating effect of capitalism eh, uh, can have on our abs obsolete miser. In capitalism, his treasure is no longer subtracted from economy, but turned into capital, and hence kindly welcomed as something to circulate. <laughs> this is, using the opposition introduced by Simone Weil, the moment of grace for our miser, who gives up on the fetishistic fixation onto his treasure, loses it somehow, and puts his hope on future gains. Doesn't this, despite Lacan's qualification of capitalism as a foreclosure, a verwerfung of castration, doesn't this resemble what happens in psychoanalysis, when imaginary fixations and petrified fantasies are slowly and carefully brought into connection with a dimension of lack, with a structural given of loss preceding any castrated pleasure. If that's the case, then one should not hesitate to qualify capitalism as psychoanalysis for the rich. But how about the worker, the Arbeiter? Samu sees at work in Freudian dreams and Marxian factories. What about those who have neither money nor any means of production? As Marx teaches us, Hardly any, or, hardly any other option is available to them than to sell their labor power, which, in more than one respect, obliges them, as Marx puts it, to recognize their debt to capital, for they owe it their lives. Like money becoming capital, like the pre-modern miser's transformation into a modern capitalist, the man and woman of no means turns into labor power. Despite obvious differences, there seems to be at least one characteristic that they have, the three of them, have in common. Capital is nothing but the expectation of more capital. The owner of it invested with the prospect of a higher or smaller return, and labor power has value only to the extent that it contributes to the creation of surplus value. In that sense, the three of them, capital, capitalist, and laborer, all belong to the future, and have radically opened themselves up in a graceful moment to the uncertainty, sorry, to the uncertainty of graceful chance. This openness to the future, this embracing of an uncertain chance, seems to be a feature exclusive to modernity. And here I'm inspired by Pascal. Of course, in many modernity and pre-modern, it's, it's, it's a thorny issue. But, you know, Pascal is my, is my uh, main reference in these things. So let's quote, for example, a passage from one of Pascal's pensées. He, uh, at a certain moment in his pensée, writes, we almost never think of the present. And if we do think of it, it's only to see what light it throws on our plans for the future. The present is never our end. The past and the present are our means. The future alone our end. Thus, we never actually live. We hope to live. And from another pensée, and here I quote again, St. Augustine saw that we take chances at sea, in battle, etc., but he did not see the rule of probability which proves that we ought to." End of quote. So there's nothing new or modern in considering the future as a matter of risk 
and chance. The novel idea, however, highlighted by Pascal, is that we have to take these chances. This oath, this uh, having to, should not be understood in a moral way, but, in a, but as the rational advice. The new science which Pascal invented, uh, the new science of probability, prepared by him and his mathematician friends, does not teach us what the future will look like, but allows for a calculation of what is the most rational action. An action, because it's reasonable, one has to undertake. Doesn't here become clear what radically distinguishes capitalists from laborer? Beyond more obvious differences, one needs to point out that a capitalist can give, invest what he has, whereas the worker can only give what he does not have. You know, it has a Lacanian ring to it. Eh? Um, the worker, the laborer, can only give what he does not have. On one hand, capital is by definition risky business, exposed to an uncertain future. Yet whatever the loss or gain, however real or fictitious one takes it to be, it remains within the order of having. Labor power, on the other hand, does not exist outside of the conditions within which the transaction, money for labor, takes place. As Marx reminds his readers quite a few times, the worker is put to work, as if his existence outside of the capitalist mode of production equals a pure potentiality without any discernible existence of its own. A talent, you know, that's a very biblical term, eh? a talent, a pure potential, as it were, a non-being handed over to the unfathomable grace of capital to whom it may eventually owe its temporary existence. This political economical theology reminds me, with your permission, of another passage in uh, Augustine, Augustine's comment on the Gospel of John. And here I quote, uh, we, the quote starts as follows, we are God's money. We are God's money. A coin, we have wandered away from the treasury. What had been stamped upon us was worn off by our wandering. He comes who may reform us because he had formed us. He himself seeks his own coin, as Caesar sought his coin. Thus he says, that's a quote from the Bible, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And now the crucial point comes, to, Caesar's, to Caesar his coins, to God you yourselves. And then truth will be expressed in us. So from our argument, the interesting opposition made by Augustine here is between giving what one has and giving what one is. To Caesar, one can render the coins one is legally or otherwise bound to pay. To God, by contrast, and for me, contemporary version of God is capital. Eh? To God, by contrast, one cannot give anything except oneself. Isn't there for uh, Samu, and that's my question, not only the worker and his exploitation, a crucial problem and you know, thing we have to think about, but also the indebted man that needs to be taken into account. It's already been talked about in the, the, the talk by uh, Julia. Huh? Here I'm not so much referring to the increasing role of all sorts of debts play on an individual economical and political level, but to the growing number of redundant, superfluous, guilty, because inconsumable, inconsumable quantities of living labor, which may, sign, uh, which may be the sign of a shift which is taking place, a shift, I think, from the age of exploitation to the age of elimination. Thank you. I, I can't respond. To this. <laughs> you can't respond. No, I can't. Uh, I, I can, but uh, I sure? think, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, um, I didn't prepare something of such uh, length. So uh, I have like a tiny question, a sort of medium sized, more convoluted question, and then a kind of observation. No, a tangential, some tangential remarks. <laughs> um, so the first tiny question is. Um, you were talking about um, this kind of finity versus finitude, and I was just thinking about that in relation to 
analysis terminable and interminable, and if there's a relation um, to that. Um, I was then thinking when you were talking about, um, you make a connection between the, the worker and um, you know, Marx's conception of the worker and Freud's conception of the neurotic, um, and you, use, you were talking a lot about kind of com compulsion and compulsivity. And so I was thinking then about um, the compulsion to repeat. Um, because I know you've you've written quite a lot about working through in Freud and, and as in you know as a kind of work, um, and and the sort of I was wondering then about how the remembering and repeating relate to that, and and that also I think relates to this point that you made at the beginning of your comments about um, Freud's insistence on the social etiology of uh, neurosis or of trauma and specifically in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, it's precisely the kind of existence or his, his encounter with the phenomenon of the uh, repetition that isn't pleasurable that makes him kind of, which through like people that he's encountered uh, who've been uh, in the First World War, who, so it's that specifically that phenomenon that, pe that is kind of the reason that kind of forces him to think about what, why is there this compulsion to repeat things that are unpleasurable? And this, in turn, leads to the invention, discovery, whatever, of the death drive, um, which, so, that comes just a few years after remembering, repeating, working through. Um, and then related to that, I read a quite... Uh, it's one of these super kind of philological articles that was written by someone who'd spent a lot of time reading different manuscripts of Beyond the Pleasure Principle and lots of correspondence um, with Freud, that Freud had during that period. Um, and it's written by a scholar called Ulrike May and it was published in uh, Psychoanalysis and History. Um, and she makes this really interesting claim based on this very kind of close reading of all of this kind of material from really literally like a few months in 1920 when Freud is kind of revising this essay. Um, and it made me, the longer version of um, Samo's paper that we both read in preparation for this ends with um, you kind of talk about uh, therapeutic practice and, and you kind of posit psychoanalytic, like the clinical encounter in a quite kind of optimistic way to a degree, I mean, yeah. And um, so it, the, the argument that this scholar makes is that actually one of the reasons that Freud also came to kind of think about uh, the death drive was his increasing thera therapeutic pessimism. That's what she kind of describes it and his, his kind, of, kind of trying to come to terms with uh, the fact that, you know, psychoanalysis, you know, it's, it's interminability, I guess, or it's impossibility. Um, yeah, so I guess I was thinking about that specifically in relation to this question of um, the social etiology that you mentioned. Um, and then I guess I'll just say something a bit more broad from my own work that maybe touches on the question of what you talk, talked about as the border between the psychological uh, and the social. Um, so something that I did a bit of work on a few years ago was the, um, the Beyond the Pleasure Principle by Freud was published in, uh, it was translated into Russian and published in the Soviet Union in 1925. Um, and it was published with an introduction by the psychologists Alexander Luria and Lev Vygotsky, uh, who at that time were involved in the quite short-lived Russian psychoanalytic society in Moscow. Um, and they kind of, <laughs> do what I think is quite, becomes quite a typical gesture in, in Freudo-Marxism, uh, which is that they attempt to read Beyond the Pleasure Principle as a kind of, as something that's sort of compatible with historical materialism. Um, and obviously it's not that easy to do that. I mean, you can, <laughs> you can say, oh look, you know, it's about like a, a people who are responding to the traumatic experience of the war. Uh, but then when you get into the stuff that's like the really weird stuff about biology um, and the kind of more, the insistence that there is a sort of inherent uh, backward looking quality to every organism, it gets a little bit more tricky to affirm it. And so what they do um, is that they basically equate eros or the life instincts with the social and they equate the death drive um, with the biological. And so 
they kind of they kind of then say that basically if you transform society then the death drive no longer is you don't have to worry about it basically um so where beyond for freud indicates something beneath behind and before he says more primitive more elementary more instinctual than the pleasure principle uh, they're looking somewhere ahead above and after into a bright yet ephemeral uh, world to come um and i found that uh, this is you know quite early in the history of psychoanalysis in a way uh, but i found that 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 seemed to conform to, to quite a classic move in some ways of, among sort of left, like people on the left trying to make psychoanalysis work for them in a sense. Um, and so I'm just going to read this quote from Jacqueline Rose's book, uh, Sexuality in the Field of Vision, because I think she really like, well captures this kind of recurring issue. <laughs> um, she says, the alternate discarding or reification of the unconscious has been the constant refrain of the Freudian left. Historically, whenever the political argument is made for psychoanalysis, this dynamic is polarized into a crude opposition between inside and outside, a radical Freudianism always having to argue that the social produces the misery of the psychic in a one-way process, which utterly divests the psychic of its own mechanisms and drives. Each time the psychoanalytic description of internal conflict and psychic division is referred to its social conditions, the latter absorb the former, and the unconscious shifts in that same moment from the sight of a division into the vision of an ideal unity to come. Yeah, and so I think where I really agree with what Samo was kind of saying at the beginning is that I think the only way that you can try to think about psychoanalysis and Marxism together is to sort of confront the ways in which they're really not like they really don't kind of neatly align. And I think that's where you're kind of showing these moments that, um, but it's not a kind of, I mean, luckily we have the concept of overdetermination, so it's fine, but yeah. <laughs> you would say that the, the, the concept of overdetermination is, uh, yeah. is some sort of aufhebung of... Uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, it just means it can be contradictory and it's yeah, fine. Yeah, 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 yeah no, of course. I, I, I think um, uh, psychoanalysis is, uh, yeah, I guess uh, um, a troublemaker that that really uh, does everything in order to prevent uh, the construction of uh, of happy happy scenarios, of uh, of of happy ends. Um, I guess that's also that's also the lesson that uh, that Freud uh, uh, drew out of um, the text that you were you were referring to. Analysis terminable and interminable. Analysis is not a happy end; it is an end. Mm -hmm. But it, it, I mean, it it basically uh, deconstructs, if I may say so, uh, or dissolves the <clears throat> the pursuit of happiness in the first place. Uh, I think may, this might be this might be one uh, uh, one lesson that um, I I would say is quite important for uh, for for the left or could be quite important for uh, for uh, for the left a certain Freudian uh, pessimism, which does not prevent him to to you know pursue uh, pursue an ending, pursue a cut. Uh, because analysis is also not about uh, making people dependent on the figure of the analyst, but to sort of uh, uh, initiate a new conflict in, in, in their lives, uh, one, that is not, one that is not only uh, uh, an enactment of remembering and repeating, uh, but, but brings the working through, the durcharbeiten. So it's kind of... Uh, I mean, of course, if we look at psychoanalysis, uh, it doesn't make sense to, to talk about it in a monolithic way because it is not. Because there, I mean, among Lacanians, there are reactionaries, uh, even though L Lacan's theory has, uh, uh, in my opinion at least, I know that there are people that disagree, uh, um, a lot of uh, nevertheless uh, uh, interesting potential for, for uh, radical left politics. Uh, uh, or at least for understanding uh, uh, the f some of the failures of, uh, of, 
uh, radical left uh, uh, politics or the problems that it encounters when, when there is the question of, of uh, mobilization or organization and transformation uh, on, on, on the table. I mean, Lacan is quite radical here. He, he says that basically surplus enjoyment is the, the main obstacle in the subject uh, uh, against, uh, uh, against uh, possible transformation uh, being triggered and uh, possible organization being brought, ab uh, brought about. Um, the, the concept of the drive is here kind of, uh, I think, a crystallization of all the ambiguities that, uh, uh, that, that psychoanalysis stands for, but I think also Marxism, or at least uh, Marx' uh, 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 critique of political economy. Uh, because there is, um, as, as uh, uh, Dominic said, and I, I, I can't, uh, but... Uh, feel anxiety with uh, <laughs> with this statement that there is a, that there is a certain synergy between capitalism and psychoanalysis, or that there is a certain positive side of capital that psychoanalysis seems to pinpoint its side of eros, as uh, as, as as Freud would put it, I guess, and the bad side would be the side of the of, of the death drive, the, the the extermination that you were you are ending with. Uh, um, elimination. Elimination. Yeah. Um, uh, still, the problem. The, the problem here is, uh, uh, I, I guess. Um, well, of course, we can't we can't separate these two aspects. Um, like Freud didn't. Uh, well, Freud did separate them, but Lacan didn't separate the the positive and the negative. The the binding and the unbinding uh, aspect of uh, of the drive, so it's a contradictory force here. Over determination also <laughs> comes uh, comes in handy. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, what what I guess um, what I guess is uh, uh, for me interesting in, uh, uh, in in the problematic of the drive is the 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 the, uh, the, the refusal in both uh, in both contexts to, to naturalize it. And I think when you were talking about uh, 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 this catastrophism of, of the present uh, in relation to capitalism and to the drive, th uh, what is trying to be achieved, I, I assume, is the naturalization of, of, uh, of uh, capitalist uh, devastation. I mean, this, this is the last thing that capitalism has left for its ideological self-justification. Self it's the inversal of, of, of the capitalist naturalism that Marx has been denouncing with the bourgeois political economy. They want to present the, the uh, institutions of bourgeois economy as natural institutions, whereas the, the institutions of religion are cultural, or are, 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 uh, are counter-natural, are artificial, blah, blah. So uh, today, I guess, catastrophe is the only way <laughs> to, to kind of perpetuate, perpetuate uh, uh, capitalism uh, or perpetuate capitalist naturalism. Uh, but uh, I would, uh, yeah, I would, I would, I guess, uh, answer with, uh, I mean, to your question with an answer that doesn't match or that doesn't map to your, uh, to your question. Of course, the question of the indebted subject, uh, uh, I think this is the flip side of labor power, and I think this is what you have been showing in your in your remark. Not only the worker, but also the indebted man. Yeah. I mean, in Marx, if we if we read read him more or less closely, uh, the transformation of labor in prim the process of primitive accumulation is the genesis of the uh, of the indebted man as well. Uh, uh, it's not uh, it's. Uh, it's one and the same thing. Uh, debt is the stuff that uh, that uh, uh, labor power is made out of. Uh, uh, I, w I would say. Uh, um, so of course uh, the the worker, and this is not a, this is not an empirical category f uh, for Marx or or the proletarian. It's not an empirical category. It's a structural uh, category. Uh, uh, has nothing left but to offer uh, its existence uh, 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 to the system. And it's love the it. apparent. It's the apparent quid pro quo. Yeah. 
the apparent quid pro quo that actually is not one uh, that Marx talks about. Uh, by, by, by selling yourself, you owe. I mean, you basically make yourself ownable. Mm. Uh, that was one, one quote that I, that I left out from, uh, mm. from this. Uh, uh, um, I was a bit jumping from one, uh, from one set of questions to yours, but I think they are, they are, they are connected and they, 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 uh, they all evolve, uh, evolve around uh, uh, the question of compulsion. Uh, uh, that is uh, the main sign that there is a drive mm. <laughs> in the room, mm. I guess, for, for both of them. I mean, Marx fully acknowledges the compulsive character of, uh, of capitalism. Well, um, yeah, yeah, I, um, I'm thinking many things at the same. Uh, um, perhaps we can return to, the, that's the only thing. I think in Lacan there is a, um, um, there's a nostalgia for desire. And in the sense that um, the patient... Nobody's perfect. Huh? Nobody's perfect. No, but that's the thing. It's, a, it's desire. Of course, we are the subject of a desire, but desire is always, let's say, in old-fashioned Freudian terms, it's repressed. And in Lacan, it's... A, it's it's uh, imaginary, misunderstood, and and so these, there's a certain uh, a certain culture of desire. There's a culture of eros. That's what psychoanalysis, I think, is about. And there's a huge. Uh, if you if you take a look, he's very much aware that th these are not the conditions we're living. The conditions psychoanalysis emerges from is, is modernity. And modernity is true and through Christian, according to Lacan. We can, of course, disagree with that, but that's, that's clear to him. And the big danger is, uh, is that uh, Christian love sub, um, uh, takes in the place of, uh, of desire. So the question is always if you look for a relation, I mean, if you talk about capitalism and a critique of capitalism, that psychoanalytic reflex is where is the subject? And how is the subject inserted into the capitalist system? And I would say the mechanism is love. And love is to give yourself. And that, I think, becomes very visible uh, in these days uh, without going, because it has uh, to do with giving, uh, giving yourself and not giving uh, what you have. Now, returning to um, what always, always also, also um, uh, intrigues me in the discussions about psychoanalysis and, 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 and critique of uh, political of culture and, and politics is um, what are you precisely doing and how can you do it? Because uh, if you think about these notions that are introduced by Freud and by Lacan, they're very practical notions. Uh, we tend to use like the unconscious and, and like and of course there are very refined, sophisticated definitions around about the unconscious, but in the end it's a practical thing. It's a hypothesis. That's why, uh, by the way, while, while Lacan talks about the subject of the unconscious, it's, it's, su it's a supposé, it's subjected. So it's something you suppose. You, you never see the subject. It's something you suppose. And that's why, in order to have you know, to take this seriously, that the subject is something that's supposed, you have to like build a practice within which the unconscious can be supposed. Yeah, yeah an experimental and, setting. And that's why I like the question about transference in that sense that the basic condition, condition of possibility of psychoanalysis is transference. Transference, simple definition, is the supposing of the unconscious. And that's what uh, psychoanalysis, I mean, where, where psych psychoanalytic work can start. So my, the, the, the issue I'm always struggling with, I mean, I find psychoanalysis extremely useful to think things, um, but I don't see what you seem to suggest is uh, that there's like, a, like um, not only to think, but like, like some sort of potential in psychoanalysis which I think then you have to think about the analytical discourse outside of the classical clinical setting where one person is listening to the other and you know there's like some sort of way of uh, you could imagine the, uh, the analytical discourse operating outside or beyond let's say or also beyond the strict confines of the analytical uh, psychoanalytical cabinet. 
Again, because psychoanalysis, this is of course a very theoretical statement, but I think it's true to say that psychoanalysis is a practice. It's something you do. Otherwise, it doesn't make, does not make sense to, uh, or at least, what would I say, it, does, it makes sense to talk about subject and the unconscious, but first and foremost, they are like practical uh, notions which you use to, to intervene and to organize a certain practice. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, uh, I agree. I'm not, I'm not suggesting uh, that there is something like a psychoanalysis of uh, social phenomena. I think psychoanalysis is, uh, 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 of course, a practice and, and an experience. But I'm against, uh, I'm against this uh, uh, um, closure of. Uh, uh, of uh, the lessons of psychoanalysis that 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 has been so uh, increasingly uh, 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 dominating, uh, for instance, the French Lacanian scene. Uh, you know, I don't want to go to uh, uh, into the discussion of you know uh, the technicalities of Lacanian theory and all this jargon that uh, uh, that you know what is the analytic discourse and so on and so forth. I think there we can also. Uh, among our, uh, ourselves agree that Lacan uh, envisages something logical with it, not only something empirical. And, and as soon as something uh, is envisaged as a logics, it is no longer uh, restricted to, uh, to the empiric conditions of an analytic cabinet. Uh, people can cure themselves, I mean themselves, uh, um, in a logically analytic way without being empirically into uh, yeah. uh, in in psychoanalysis and uh, you know the, the case of Joyce has been mentioned which is kind of an, an unhappy case but you know uh, Freud already was was saying that uh, uh, um, for instance uh, um, I mean, this is also his fet fetish uh, you know uh, uh, Renaissance art uh, uh, there you can see uh, you know like an attempt in sublimation. We can find this problematic or not, but whatever. I mean, he's recognizing uh, an, a, an achievement that he's, you, he would normally associate with psychoanalysis in a different practice in, 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 and in a different uh, uh, subjective and social, uh, social framework. Um, so, you know, of course, I am, I am against wild psychoanalysis. Let's just treat the entire society as, an, uh, as one big individual uh, because I don't uh, uh, believe that, that society can be, you know, like mapped one-on-one -on, -one, uh, on the individual, but also because I think the individual does not exist. I don't believe in existence of individuals. <laughs> uh, this, I think this is the main, the main point that psychoanalysis teaches one. There are no individuals. That doesn't mean that uh, uh, or we it's are not important. I mean, yeah, 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 exist, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, individual bodies exist, and uh, and uh, individual dysfunctionings of, of the symbolic order in, in individual bodies exist. But uh, you know, these these dysfunctionings are the ones that are pointing beyond the paradigm of individuality that has been uh, uh, predominant throughout modernity. Uh, 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 or all the attempts of normalization that have been artificially sustained. Kerstin has been talking about one of them, uh, uh, the, the, the normalization of, uh, of uh, uh, sexuality in the binary and heteronormative uh, uh, model. I think you know, this, is, this is something that, that, that is also an important component uh, of, of psychoanalytic critique of, of sexuality. That's why also I, I think uh, it's not only, uh, you know, psychoanalysis, I don't think only contributed to the normalization, but also to the, to, 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 to the attempt to, to show where this fails, where this normalization of the sexual fails, or at least a certain psychoanalysis did. Uh, and uh, I mean, I would, I, would, I would go back to, to what you were saying, Hannah. This, uh, this, I, I, find it, I find it fascinating. Also, I, I've read this, uh, this introduction to, to Beyond the Pleasure uh, uh, Principle. Uh, 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 and and this, is, this is sort of a, sort of a very exam, exam, exemplary uh, um, um, 
and of uh, crystallization of all the discontent, unbehagen, you know, that psychoanalysis, or that Freud at least triggered in his excessive moments, uh, which are not moments of clinics, they are speculations about clinical phenomena. Uh, speculations about this, uh, this compulsion uh, that runs our, uh, our lives and that also goes against the, 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 the hypothesis of, of individualism. Uh, um, so I guess, uh, I mean, I, 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 I wanted to, to also uh, refer back to, the, to you bringing uh, Jacqueline Rose into, uh, into play. Uh, Jacqueline Rose is basically an example of a, of a, of a Lacanian feminist mm -hmm. who's uh, very much, you know, has very much uh, pinpointed the difference between structural uh, uh, yeah, structural take uh, uh, on this link between Marxism and psychoanalysis and the historical Freudo-Marxism, Freudo uh, which tried to decide the undecidable in, uh, uh, in Freud, something that should not be decided. Uh, so, I mean, would, would you say that that, uh, that is an example of a, that is an example that should be followed, or are you, are you skeptical towards, uh, uh, towards it? I don't know about it as an example to be followed. I feel like it, it just is, it's helpful for pinpointing certain tendencies maybe in certain. I was actually thinking when you were speaking at, at the beginning of what you were saying about pessimism, because I was actually thinking about some of Rebecca Comey's work on um, the drive in relation to the dialectic. And she even says at one point that she, re she, she calls Hegel's phenomenology an, an example of interminable analysis. And she insists on reading um, uh, like the kind of end of phenomen the, the phenomenology as this kind of very open-ended sort of, mm. uh, yeah, like, and, and, and constantly refers back to, to the kind of the drive and this kind of compulsive. Mm. I think in another place she, she talks about Lady Macbeth and the kind of washing of the hands and the kind of uh, com compulsive uh, revisiting of the, of the site of trauma. Um, but I, actually I was thinking, because in your, when you were talking about you know, the, the idea that the death drive is then seen as the sort of the, the, bad, the bad kind of thing. Mm. I think she has a really interesting uh, kind of like counterintuitive reading of the death drive, which, which is this, this idea that actually, however impossible it might be, the idea that because the, the death drive is about the, the, uh, the, re the reinstatement of an original condition, <laughs> that it therefore offers this strange possibility to kind of start over, to act as if all of everything <laughs> hadn't kind of all gone uh, one way. So it's sort of almost a kind of utopian <laughs> concept in this strange mm. rereading. So I find that quite helpful, but obviously it's also uh, an impossible and kind of unending thing. But um, I, I, I find that reading of, of the death drive quite helpful because I think the word death is quite misleading <laughs> in, mm. in, in the, in the in it somehow, because <laughs> it's all about going backwards, not yeah, about yeah. going forwards. Well, I mean, uh, Alenka Zupancic also has this, uh, 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 let's say, optimistic reading of, uh, uh, of the death drive in, uh, in her um, uh, What is Sex? But I must say, I mean, I'm, even though I, I, I go along with, uh, 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 with these readings and I find them very convincing, I think uh, uh, at the same time, um, they, they also decide something in Freud that is supposed to remain uh, undecided. Uh, uh, I, I, I agree with you that the, the, the death is misleading, but I think it's also misleading if, uh, if we forget that uh, Freud actually meant it with the death, uh, with, with the negative connotation uh, or with the negativity that, 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 that the, the word death is, uh, uh, is invested with. So, of course, there, there can be uh, this kind of uh, orientation towards the end that can also be something like a you know, uh, transformative impact of a, of a, of a laboring process, of, of, of a certain Durchabeiten. Uh, but uh, um, the... That's why, that's why I think uh, uh, maybe the problematic of the, of the drive in Marx, of the drive of capital as the drive in its 
whole indifference towards our existence or survival or or you know the breakdown of the uh, uh, of the global ecosystem uh, uh, this this radical indifference uh, uh, nevertheless kind of bring, brings back the like very literal meaning of uh, of death uh, uh, and the very liter literal meaning that I think Freud is also targeting at when he talks about the the uh, m mortal dimension, uh, uh, the mortal dimension of uh, of the drives pursuit of uh, uh, of enjoyment uh, 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 independently of the well-being of of their bodily carriers. Uh. How, how are we with what time, time should we finish? Should we should have some other questions. Uh, uh, yeah. What time are we supposed to finish? Uh, what time are we supposed to finish? Sorry? 45 minutes. OK. In 45 minutes. <laughs> OK, so there is a lot of discussion <laughs> time. <laughs> Well, we are we are done here uh, among <laughs> ourselves. So so we let's should, stop yeah. being autistic. Yeah. <laughs> hey. No? No? Yes? Okay. Um, so some of my, I, I, I'm, I'm always been fascinated about this drive in Marx and then drive in Freud. Uh, but then you said this thing about how the, the, there's a different drive in the miser and a different drive in the capitalist. And I wondered if you would, wh which drive you would link to, which drive, sorry. What? People are pointing, oh no, not to me. Okay, 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 sorry. Uh, which drive you would link to f the Freudian death drive? Like, is, is, is Freud, and this, this, I think, ties to this thing that you said was disturbing, like this link between psychoanalysis and capitalism, because people always ask me this, like, isn't psychoanalysis just an effect of capitalism? And I want to say maybe not at all. But so I, I, I'm curious about where you link those, because it seems like there's three drives maybe at work, right? And so. How would you m map those which, out? Which is the third one? Well, like the like the Freud. Isn't there a drive? You said there's a drive of the miser, a drive of the capitalist, and then there's the Freudian death drive. So how could you? No, no. But I mean, I, I think. Uh, um, well, actually, you know, uh, uh, your uh, suggestion that capitalism uh, can be considered as a culture of of, of death drive. Um, it's, un it's something that I that I find uh, uh, theoretically, uh, or you know, as a thesis, uh, uh, very appealing, and uh, I, I'm, well, basically, I agree with it. Uh, uh, but the, the but death drive in capitalism is, I guess, a certain decision about the ambiguity that that uh, uh, Freud pinpoints on the concept of, uh, or on the force of the drive and tries to conceptualize it. Uh, and he conceptualizes it with, uh, I mean, he thinks that he's making a rationalization. Okay, there are too many drives. People have been running wild with uh, uh, the, uh, the assumption of ever new drive, play drive, uh, uh, sex drive, uh, uh, oral drive, blah, blah drive. Uh, so I will, do, I will do an attempt of uh, um, rationalization and bring them down to Eros and, uh, uh, and, and Thanatos, ba binding and unbinding. So isolating a contradiction of the, you, well, this is all known story. Um, uh, bind, bring, breaking them down to two drives. Uh, we both subscribe to Lacan's reading that this is one drive which is in itself inconsistent and I guess uh, the, cap the development of capitalism that Dominic has uh, 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 reminded us uh, of, uh, well, the, most, the youngest development uh, towards, uh, uh, you know, like ending the movie, 
it's, uh, uh, is, is, reminding, uh, is reminding us precisely that uh, this dimension of death in the most literal sense is becoming more and more present uh, 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 in the drive of capital. Uh, that, that would be my clumsy attempt to, to kind of an answer this. So capital as a progressive decision of, of the death drive as really a dri uh, drive of destruction. Uh, that Freud doesn't, again, that Freud doesn't deny uh, but you talk about yeah you talk about the survival of capital um, as a drive for self-preservation meaning I guess its own preservation yeah. at the expense of the survival of, of people i.e. workers who yeah. are yeah so that kind of which I guess doesn't map neatly onto the foot but it sort of makes sense to me as yeah, a kind uh, of yeah 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 no, and no, I mean, again, I, I guess in the present, paradoxically, uh, capitalism can only sustain itself logically and empirically uh, uh, by consequently pursuing uh, 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 climate breakdown. It cannot do anything but that. Uh, but that then seems quite different from the, the kind of the kind of stuff in Freud about the difference between simply wanting, you know, like the death drive isn't like a kind of suicide wish, right? It's about no, no. this thing about like wanting to die one's own natural death, that, that kind of weird thing that, that, that paradoxically uh, the, the, the kind of the death drive manifests actually as a kind of will to prolong life precisely mm. because the organism is so intent on uh, only dying its natural death, like i.e. the death that is supposedly inscribed in it from the beginning or something. And yeah, I mean, yeah. this I'm going into the super speculative weird yeah, stuff yeah, in yeah, Beyond yeah, the Pleasure yeah. Principle, but I kind of, find, yeah, so it's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, this is this is precisely the drive that exceeds uh, that exceeds the subject, you know. As, as uh, uh, you know, if, if we bring Lacan's uh, concept into uh, back into into the discussion, uh, and uh, um, if we would understand the death drive as uh, you know the subject's driving tendency towards uh, death, suicidal wish, or whatever, this would be a wrong. Psychologization of the of the death drive. It's uh, precisely pinpointing the contradiction between uh, uh, the survival of or survival tendencies of uh, of an organism and the, the the tendency to last of of the drive. Uh, yeah, which is why I thought the reference to the kind of climate yeah, yeah, change yeah, 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 was yeah, yeah. kind of interesting. Yeah. Okay, um, <laughs> this will be a slightly chaotic question, I fear, but um, because it has, yeah, it has two parts. The one is you were saying, Samu, um, that is the stuff labor power is made of. Like literally, you were saying that, and <laughs> but um, which I find interesting. But it's interesting because that's on the one hand, obviously a very anti-vitalist argument, but it displaces vitalism sort of like Hegel did in religion. <laughs> so it's like, it displaces it from labor power, like it's an anti-workerist argument in a way, but only because it can displace of vitalism and put it in religion. And I was wondering again, like with this question of like where modernity ensues or like what, how, how it restructures itself uh, and how far it would then be vital to like Ross Morris did in this book of the returns of fetishes uh, recently to say, well, actually, if we want to think about um, a fundamental critique of 
the capitalization of life, then we have to not look at Hegel's phenomenology or logic, but at the, his anthropology and his writings on religion. And the same with Kant, because this is where modernism disposed of its vitalism in order to like function, machinize itself. Mm. That's the one side of the question. And the other one is shorter. Um, so, uh, if uh, that, like what you, you and Hannah were saying at the end about the death drive, then the death, did, then the death drive would be, in a way, the only thing that exceeds labor, in contempt, like in within capitalism. I mean, in the sense that exceeds labor in the sense of I don't know, Fassbinder's in a year of thirteen moons, where the. Mm -hmm. The, the suicidalist says, like, um, the suicidalist is not uh, giving up on life, but really hating the way it's given to him. Mm. So, yeah, that's the other question. Uh, it's, con it's going to be a chaotic answer for sure, because the questions were not chaotic. Uh, on the contrary, no, I mean, it's, well, the, I, 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 I don't really... Um, I think I'll have to ask you again, uh, uh, I mean, uh, to, kind of to repeat the part of the displacement of, uh, of vitalism from, uh, um, I mean, in Hegel and in Kant from, well, sis systematic philosophy into uh, philosophy of religion, uh, because I'm, I, I'm not, uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't get, uh, uh, I have troubles finding a way into entering it. Uh, uh. Um, because, I mean, Rosalind Morris' argument is that fetishism was born out of wanting to get rid of uh, what she calls the uh, promiscuity of significance in the world of fetishes. As long as there are practices with fetishes, but not fetishism, mm. one cannot pose religion as like the more thought well, thoughtful yeah, yeah. way, a systematic way of dealing with it. And so religion, like if labor is based on debt, yeah. like literally, not metaphorically, then the question is why labor at all? And then the answer to the question why labor at all, like, if, like systematically speaking, um, would be in religion because there is a need to justify one's existence because religion became systemic. Uh, yeah. And that's a need which doesn't arise in, I don't know, the, the West African practices Ross Morris yeah, writes yeah, yeah. about uh, with the fetishists. Yeah, that's yeah. I no, but I, I think that was, that was, basically, that was basically Dominic's, uh, uh, Dominic's thesis, uh, uh, if I understood uh, that correctly. <laughs> maybe, that's, maybe that was the question naming it. No, I mean, the, the, when I said this sentence about, about death and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, I mean, death, debt and, and uh, labor and uh, the next, the, the continuum that, uh, uh, that exists between them or the sameness even that, uh, that exists uh, uh, between them in capitalism, I was thinking, uh, uh, I, I had in mind uh, uh, Marx's chapter on, on primitive accumulation that has been discussed widely uh, in, uh, uh, since 2008 in all possible corners and, uh, and, and versions. And uh, I guess Marx is envisaging there uh, the transformation and also demystification of, of religious debt, guilt nexus uh, into an economic, uh, 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 into an economic Debt guilt uh, guilt nexus. So uh, uh, what what happens there is is a transformation through quantification. Uh, uh, very quickly said. So the the demystification of the religious debt uh, 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 and maybe also a certain point of continuity between the religious uh, contextualization of debt and the the capitalist uh, uh, economic contextualization of it is that uh, uh, that it. In both ends, there is a certain uh, production of a profit, uh, some sort of profitability uh, at stake. But it's only capitalism that that makes out of uh, out of that that a social economic category, not not religion. No, but also that makes yeah. religion. I'm sorry, like I yeah. don't want to get annoying, but like. <laughs> 
No, but also that makes religion because you don't need religion without capitalism. Like you can have like mystical practices, esoteric practice, like yeah. whatever, what, whatever. But like religion is a figuration, is a capital figuration, like the systemic form. I mean, yeah, that uh, was sort of like the discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part. Okay. Uh, no, no, of course. Yeah, I know that this monopolization that, that religion makes on truth also. Uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, you were tar targeting also also that that it defines itself as true in relation to or indifference or, or in delimitation from from fetishism by producing fetishism. Should we take this uh, the question at the? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to pick up on the um, on the transference question, um, and that I, I want to pick up on that again because I feel that there's a or my suggestion would be that between the um, there's a problem with uh, psychoanalysis and transference argument, and what I will now term the free speech for psychoanalysis argument, where the first one says. We don't have transference to collective bodies, so we can't actually apply um, psychoanalysis. And the other one says, well, but at some point, you know, like either as um, Leon said earlier, like the experience is becoming a conceptual tool, and then we can apply it as we want, or as you just said, like, yeah, but we shouldn't forget about, you know? So I would, I would think, to me, um, there's a question of uh, embodiment there, and of the body of the, of the analyst. Um, and that is because uh, I would think that between those two positions, um, there is the position that would say, well, there is some transference. That's my counter-transference onto the collective body, right? And I could read that. Mm -hmm. But that would mean I would need to put my own body on the line, yeah? And I would need to get out of the master position, out of the heterosexual, cisgender, white, you know, hegemonial position. And, uh, and sign with my individual body for my, for my analysis. Um, and, I, um, uh, and, uh, and, and so I think like in this question, there are, um, there are uh, political stakes at work, right? Are you ready? So my, my suggestion would be there's a cer third position. And the question is, are you ready to leave the power position and do the better kind of analysis, uh, which is uh, less hegemonial. And just to like cite somebody, and I would recommend reading Jameson Webster's recent book, um, uh, Conversion Disorder, uh, about this topic. Just, you know, like, because, because traditionally, right, like the hegemonial body doesn't show up as a body. That's the, mm. that's the background assumption, right? You're, like, you don't, if, if you have the hegemonial position, you don't have to uh, be embodied. You, you're like that. You don't need the body, to, you don't need to, the body. To, to exercise power, yeah. Exactly. So my suggestion would be, if you want to do that, please put your body on the line. <laughs> Did you want to? Huh? No, no, no. Have you have yours. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. No, no, please. <laughs> no, well, I don't know whether it's like a, a relevant reply uh, or, or, or a comment, but um, the thing is, if you look at um, uh, the Lacanian idea about uh, an analysis and the, and the psychoanalytic act, it is that uh, the necessary requirement is that someone occupies the position of the object A. It's, I think, not difficult to find this position. It's everywhere. I mean, uh, that position of object A. I think it's, it's uh, we live in the area of, of era of object A. All that waste, you know, human waste. These are all, all have the potential or all operate in a certain way as, uh, as, um, as, as like a possible point which questions um, the economy of desire which produces that surplus which no one knows what to do with it or how to deal with it. But the thing is, um, 
um, you can imagine object A being in that position outside of the analytical cure and outside of the the building and it's in the room, but of course it's also, um, that's the whole analysis is of course you, one occupies the position of the object A, but then one maneuvers it, you know, one, one uses it that position in order to hystericize, in order to provoke desire, and then to reflect back desire, and so it's a whole, it's a whole work, to use your preferred uh, word, uh, it's a whole work of, um, of uh, analytic labor that needs to be going on. And I think that's very hard to imagine on a political level. That's, that would be the other version of my question. How to imagine um, that waste, which is so uh, present and so abundantly, how imagine this to have this operative effect? Practice, practice, practice. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, fi form a group. Uh, start doing it, right? Yeah. I, I, I would think it's important, you know, to understand that, like, I mean, just as in order for an anal anal analyst to become an analyst, you know, you have to go through, like, practice, practice, practice. If you want to transpose this, mm -hmm. I would think, in a relevant way to a political analysis in, with a strong, with a capital A analysis, right? You would have to, to, um, to uh, measure yourself against the same... Uh, against the same uh, standard, right? And say, of course, you know, like, yeah, it's hard to imagine. We need to practice. Probably we need to practice together. Probably you can't do it by yourself. But yeah, collectivize, organize. <laughs> No, but it's true. I agree. I, I, I agree precisely with this uh, with this point that uh, that the analyst is not the name of a of a meta position, and that's position. the problem. No, well, that 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 as well. Yeah, that as well. But uh, the way the way analysts, uh, also Lacanian or, or more and more Lacanian uh, analysts, uh, uh, behave as if they are assuming uh, an outside position. Uh, as if they, make, as if they are the to think that you are a psych, you, you never are uh, a psychoanalyst. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, Freud was not ashamed to uh, to admit that. I mean, that was that was one of the points uh, of analysis: terminable and interminable. I mean, one has to actually adopt a certain virtual uh, endlessness uh, or, uh, um, of analysis. Not because, because, not only because uh, um, one cannot assume that there will be a, a state of full, you know, recovery or whatever, or that there is such a state, even possible, uh, possible or, or imaginable, some sort of uh, fictitious normality. But also because, uh, because uh, analysts themselves should should not ever believe that they have achieved this. The analyst is not imposing uh, normality. Assumes, I mean, that's, that's what I find interesting in Freud's, uh, in Freud's text. He says we have to assume that there, is, that there is a normal person in there somewhere. Normal in the sense that he or she wants the cure, wants to, wants to work on some sort of improvement and not only sabotage with resistance uh, after uh, these people show up in uh, uh, in the cabinet and lie on the couch or sit or whatever they do, talk. Uh, um, but it's an empty hypothesis, and it, yeah, that's that's precisely what has been uh, then filled with content with with ego psychology and with uh, with uh, with also today instant uh, therapeutic practices. They assume that normality is is is, is uh, is actually a state and not just this uh, uh, very normal desire for, for, for cure. Should we take a few questions yeah. together yeah, 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 yeah. so that we get through them? Maybe three in a row? One, so just to sort of sort it out a little bit of this discussion, uh, in particular, Samo, in your presentation, you uh, it's differentiated between logical and the empirical, and in a way, the um, the denaturalization of uh, that drive 
is from miser to the capitalist as a function, right? Uh, capitalist is actually almost like a, this uh, is a, a functionary in a structural uh, sort of uh, drive-like uh, machine, let's say, or mechanism. So uh, in there, you also said that drive is neither just cultural nor natural, just reminded that as well which made me think about the, uh, the, the, uh, the notion of culture of death drive, capitalism as a culture of death drive. That is, what is the status of, in that sense, fetishism? Uh, is it just a, a garnish to this machine, which I don't think you're saying, but I'm just clarifying in my mind as well, but it is this fetish is itself also what all these little micropolit micro libidinal economies of fetish themselves what propels this uh, at the same time, this structural, right? The other side of this logical is the empirical, muck of the empirical, right? In the sense that there is the structural but also the empirical and they're not like um, separable in any form or shape. Uh, they are the other side of each other. Uh, and the causality is not necessarily on either side, so to speak. And that's the, uh, maybe the embodiment question, the uh, symptom question. The clinic, in the clinic, you keep on seeing the, uh, the fetish as coming in as that's not re uh, really uh, shakable. The stuckness of it is there, which actually keeps the uh, compulsion to repeat to happen. Yet at the same time, this compulsion to repeat to happen has a very formal structure, which the analyst needs to always go back to so that they could hy hystericize. They could make that moment of hystericization. So that's how I'm understanding this debate a little bit. Um, OK, should we take another two questions and then? Will you be able to retain? <laughs> yeah. So, um, my question is basically what happens to class and class struggle in a synthesis of Marxism and psychoanalysis? I mean, specifically, uh, Samuel, you gave us a very interesting talk about, about the worker and the unconscious as a kind of work, but also as a kind of capitalist drive. And are these two figures uh, of the unconscious, or is it in the sense that you know, the unconscious knows no contradiction? Are, these, are we all driven as workers and driven to accumulate at once? Um, my, my question will be very related to the last note when we talk about there's an optimistic um, perspective on death drive. And I wonder whether that's actually kind of dangerous because it's seemingly very naively anticipating there's a second innocence that cannot really be happened. And as if there's like, you know, an imagined outside that we can still consciously grasp or imagine after, you know, that very optimistic view of death drive. Which actually reminds me of uh, Simone Fay when there's like also in Gravity and Grace, she talks about how instead of religion, revolution is actually the, op the opium of the people, which I find it interesting because previously she's also a kind of anarchist communist and very much actually critical towards um, revolution practice and describing a form of capitalist death drive actually as a form of a machine that can actually be detached, which I guess they will lead to my second question that like um, in some way you talk about how like this capitalist drive in itself actually in, in a certain way materialized, actualized. And I wonder can then actually we see it as almost like a virtual object and therefore have a different conscious relationship to it as in seeing even though in itself is very endless, but then because of this conscious realization we can have a temporal relationship to it, a temporal um, attach and detachment and therefore in that way actually would have another um, more optimistic, I guess, thought on what is considered change or not. But then my third question would also be very connected, I'm sorry, is that how can this, I guess, this form of practice, I cannot help but ask like how is it not neurotic or pathological in its way? Um, particularly it seems that uh, it does not really have a certain ethical ground, particularly considered its endlessness, but can only found its ground on always imagine a certain enemy, which I would 
in one example, imagine it to be a assumption of normalization. Like always assume that there's this force for normalization that is going on and imagine that as enemy and therefore the constant practice can be seen as not pathological or pointless. It's not? Not pathological or pointless in any way. Like that the change can actually be consciously grasped as meaningful and empowering. Thank you. I mean, I would, uh, can I? <laughs> um, that's, that's the idea. <laughs> I'll try to bundle them. Uh, I'll try to bundle them together because they, uh, they, are, they are in a way uh, all addressing the question, I mean, what to do with psychoanalysis and where, where does psychoanalysis stand in a way also. Uh, 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 in, well, let's say politically, uh, uh, and I, I, I would depart basically, from Jason, from your question of uh, uh, of class struggle. Uh, what happens to it? Well, I, I mean, I would I would maybe turn it around and, and say where does psychoanalysis stand in in this struggle? Because one one can observe it historically, uh, assuming both 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 sides, uh, depending on yeah how. Uh, uh, how um, persistent it was in in, pursue, uh, uh, in, in pursuing its uh, own social recognition, and I think Freud is not uh, 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 is not an exception uh, here. And of course, if you want to uh, if you want to kind of uh, uh, um, find political radicalism in uh, uh, in Freud, we are not going to have much uh, uh, much success. And he's also very uh, hesitant in uh, uh, naming the culture that he analyzes in civilization, or civilization. Uh, well, it's been translated as civilization into English. Uh, in civilization and its discontent. It's, it's clear that he's talking about uh, his own uh, cultural milieu, not, not about some culture in, uh, in the abstract. Uh, um, and of course, I mean, there are also other, other passages where he's saying, well, class struggle, this is not something that I, want, that I can do much with. We are dealing with the conflict of drives. Uh, and this is a different, uh, a different conflict. And I mean, it, it is true. But uh, at the same time, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a practice that, that immerse emerged in the midst of, uh, of, of a very polarized uh, 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 social uh, context. Uh, so I, I assume that what I'm trying to pursue is uh, uh, basically the potential that exists on the level of, of, of psychoanalysis uh, 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 to place itself on the right side of the, uh, of the class antagonism. Uh, uh, and maybe there, Marx, you know, Marxism is, uh, of course, broader than, than anything that psychoanalysis had, uh, produced theoretically and practically. Uh, because it is a different theory and practice. I'm not saying that they're, again, I'm not saying they're one, one and the same. Uh, but uh, what is certain for me is that psychoanalysis is, uh, is traversed by, by, by class struggle. Uh, uh, as any field of uh, uh, the theory and practice, uh, it can be mobilized uh, in different directions. So where, where I would also come to, to, to your remarks, and I must apologize, I, I, I couldn't really uh, 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 follow, uh, fo uh, follow everything that you were saying, but the, the, uh, I think the main, the, the main uh, concern that I, uh, uh, that, that I got is the question of uh, uh, whether psychoanalysis can actually be detached from all the, uh, uh, well, all the negative connotations that have been, uh, 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 that, that have been attached to, uh, to it throughout, uh, throughout the history and whether this can actually be a practice of empowerment and of, uh, 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 of a certain political optimism. I, I think it's, it's uh, 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 
I think it's again a, que uh, a question of, uh, of a certain work that, uh, that, that psychoanalysis addresses to someone who wants to, who wants to make it uh, 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 a politically subversive, or maybe not only politically subversive practice, uh, but, but a practice that actually actively contributes to, to uh, uh, the imperatives of uh, social transformation. Um, I know that I'm I'm missing a lot of of, of your uh, uh, of your points that you are making, but that's again I apologize. It's uh, uh, maybe uh, Anna, uh, Anna and Dominic have something to add because it's not just yeah. you can on I the spot. <laughs> can I just respond to the question? Because I think it's uh, I. I I didn't really mean to, to use the word optimistic, it was quite imprecise. I just meant <laughs> when I was talking about um, this particular reading of the death drive that I found useful because I, I, I guess what I, it's, it's, it's definitely in fact pessimistic, um, but I guess what, what, I've, what I've always found frustrating is, is that in so many of the very famous kind of Freudo-Marxist uh, readings, people like Marcuse or Reich, um, it's eros is the thing that they think is good, right? And that they're like, we're just going to get rid of, 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 of the death drive when we transform society, so that's fine, we don't have to think about it then. Um, which I just think is kind of, hmm, really? Um, and so I've always just felt like, okay, you're just kind of, like, why are you even bothering to go through psychoanalysis at all if you're just going to get rid of these things? Um, like, I've, it's always sort of troubled me. And then I actually found this kind of almost like, yeah, like in staying with the sort of tension between the life instincts and, and, and the death, and the death um, drive as... And uh, this kind of, uh, like, this idea of this sort of, this kind of ne necessarily kind of continuous, ongoing, never finishing process, to me did have a sort of something that I felt like you could take something from it politically, which isn't, which isn't that optimistic, actually. <laughs> but it's not, um, it, it, didn't, it didn't strike me either as, as, as like, I guess the other th theories maybe struck me as slightly too naive or something. And so for me, it was, I was optimistic about the pessimism, if that makes sense. And quickly on the question about class struggle, this isn't an answer to that question because blah. Uh, but I just was reading recently some of Freud's work, like where he talks about the narcissism of small differences. Um, and when he talks about like, what is the narcissism of small differences? He gives a few examples and he's like, you know, like these, like this nation that lives near this nation, whatever. But one of the examples he gives, and I think he gives it in two separate places, is the proletariat for the bourgeoisie. <laughs> and it's just like such a bad example. It's like the worst example. <laughs> it's like, I was just like, wow, he so doesn't get it. Uh, which, that's sorry, that's not an answer class, to your man. question. But <laughs> that would be the narcissism of small differences that we're all middle class now. <laughs> As Tony Blair once famously said. <laughs> Sorry, Dominic, did you have anything to... <laughs> so, um, any final words? Oh, where we've got it. I did have a question, which was really just one I asked Samo before that I don't think he answered probably rightly. Uh, can you imagine such a thing as a communist or psyche or a communist libidinal economy? Because I think, I think I maybe could or can or should... A should. You know, I think sh the should. I think the should is uh, is is the crucial. Uh, One of those crucial three. Here. Yeah, yeah. But but there, that that's again. Uh, I mean, I, I guess uh, here I would ally uh, totally with uh, what uh, Hannah said, uh, uh, being optimistic about pessimism, uh, because there have been historical attempts to to imagine. Uh, communist uh, uh, libidinal economy or communist uh, uh, love or whatever you want to, uh, uh, to call it, or communist society, uh, which have always, uh, uh, at least on, on, on me, made the impression of being capitalist fantasies. Uh, uh, um, so, so I think it's, m I'm not saying that there aren't elements already existing in the present, out of which we, we could construct uh, something that we, 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 we say communist, uh, uh, communist libid libidinal economy. Mm -hmm. But I think this uh, m might have, uh, uh, might, might lead also to um, uh, bad surprises or, or, or maybe not necessarily good consequences. Mm -hmm. 
especially if we understand them as, as, as being imperative, mm. that, that, that they have to be uh, uh, you know, like implemented. Well, yeah, by whom, yeah. But by whom? <laughs> I uh, mean, there's uh, not much risk of that. Yeah. Um, Do you have one? I don't know, I guess, I suppose you, I just, yeah, I mean, I just think it's that kind of boring question that, you know, if, well, we want things to be better. You know, yeah. no matter how pessimistic, it's not a purely negative definition. You know, it's it's got to have a kind of sense of, you know, I mean, the practice of psychoanalysis, as you're saying, you know, is predicated on a notion of the better, no matter how pessimistically put yeah. or yeah. how qualified or how kind of traversing negativity, identifying with your symptom. They're all better yeah. than what it is to suffer now. Yeah, I mean, that's why you go into analysis. It's worse, you know, your own... You, I think it's that's worse what living as you say, are. Yeah. You go in f to, to make it better by going through something maybe worse, but you, that's... I you think that there. was my it's point, that it's like it's arduous and it doesn't finish, but it's yeah. still kind of necessary and it's still yeah, but it's better get than better, not doing it. it. Yeah, yeah, but it's also got to... You know, it's not got to be interminable in the... I was thinking of the bad infinity sense. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, that yeah, would run into the problem that I was trying to identify this morning, that if it's... If we just all constantly fail again, fail better is a very annoying thing. You know, I'm not a big fan of Beckett. But, you know, it's got to be better in some mm. sense. Otherwise, there's very little point. And of course you know, or the rejoinder would be just live with what you've got. You know, that would be the classic right-wing rejoinder to, to people like us is stop moaning. <laughs> you know, this is good. This is as good as you're going to get. You know, it's people like you moaning that are, you know, making it worse. Mm blah, blah, blah. They, I mean, that's a kind of, that's a libidinal economy, if you like, of the right. Is to yeah, yeah, yeah. Full of its own resentment and mm. <laughs> moaning and complaining. But, yeah. So that's why I do. Shall I draw you to a close? Do you want a rest? Sorry? Shall I draw you to a close? Yes. I believe if I got my schedule correct, we start again at six. Thank you all for your excellent questions.